Hello everyone and welcome back to Theory Central, the go-to place for all your musical, theoretical and spiritual needs. We've already covered timing and pitch, which is a great start. We're officially 1% of the way there. Hooray! In today's video, we're going to be looking at how lyrics are written on a piece of music. Just for ease, we're only going to be looking at lyrics written in English. Danke. Let's take a moment to consider the basic building blocks of singing and how we use our voices. When we sing, each note we produce is vocalised with a vowel sound. We can produce vowel sounds on different pitches and for specific lengths. We do this all the time in natural speech and in singing. Let's consider how changing the speed at which you speak, and particularly how long or at what pitch you sound the words, can affect the meaning of the sentence. Let's consider a common speech pattern that is to raise the pitch at the end of a sentence, or when asking a question, or if you're from Australia, big love to the Australian squad. Or as demonstrated here, sometimes upward inflections can be overused. Where every sentence ends as if it were a question. Where every sentence ends as if it were a question. To the people who speak like this, please get help. So in everyday speech, we're using pitch and rhythm in our voice to convey meaning. We do this in music too, in a very similar way. However, Whilst in speech your voice and patterns show what a beautiful, unique butterfly you really are, in choir singing the pitch and rhythms are very precisely defined. Let's start with just a vowel. Let's sing that vowel on a specific pitch for a designated time, shown by the musical notation. I know I don't need to explain this too deeply as you're all experts after watching the first two videos, aren't you? Here we have an R vowel, sung on this pitch for one beat which just so happens to be a full second in this example. Let's try that for two beats. And now for four. As you might notice, not much actually changes in these examples, except the type of notes shown. Take a look at video one again of this series if you need reminding on how we can understand the length of notes for now, let's be happy knowing we can make these vowel sounds last for as long as we like, or at least until we need to breathe. Along with the vowels, we form words by sounding consonants. Let's take a look at this example, just the word goat. Here we have the consonant g, followed by the vowel, something like an o vowel, and then a final consonant t. The g sound is on or in anticipation of the beat. Let's not go down that particular rabbit hole right now. So yeah, we sound the g and then the o vowel for the duration of the note. In this case, one beat, and then sound the final consonant near the end of that one beat. Goat. Let's try that with a longer note. All we alter to change the duration of the note is to extend the vowel sound and place the final consonant at the end of this. Here we have a two beat note. Good. Words can contain multiple syllables, and syllables can be sung on several notes. Lyrics in musical notation is written out by syllables. This is because each note we sing is sounded on a single syllable. Sometimes multiple notes will be used for one syllable. This is called a melisma, and it is notated like this. The one syllable word, goat, is now stretched out over three different pitches. We can see the word has an underscore lasting for the duration of the sequence of notes. Here we would sound the consonant g and vocalize the vowel o on three pitches rising. O. Then the final consonant at the end of the note. T. Go. Here we have a three syllable word. Fantastic, which has been made to last for five notes using this melisma idea. Notice we now have an iPhone connecting the different syllables, showing that the word isn't finished, but we are moving on to the next syllable. We sound the f at the first syllable, r vowel lasts for two notes, and then we sound the n and t consonants next to each other, because the n comes at the end of the first syllable and the t begins the second syllable. The second syllable, our vowel, lasts for two notes, and then we sound the s and the t together, merging the second and third syllables, finishing with an e vowel and the final k to complete the word. 
Remember, notes can only be vocalized on a vowel. The n, s, and k consonants that end each syllable can only be placed right at the end of each syllable's pattern of notes. Fantastic. Go on, have a go. Have a go singing this musical example because it really is the pinnacle of musical composition work. It absolutely grinds my gears. You know the amount of times when you just say, sing this note for this many beats, and all you get is a like, sea of hissing snakes, and oh, it's just not the consonant, just don't extend the consonant. The consonants are just nice and short at the end of each syllable, end of each word. It's, I mean, you know, sometimes it's like bashing your head against a brick wall, really. Or you just say just the R, the E, or anything. The vowel sound in the middle, make that nice and long. Keep the consonants lovely and short. And together, they've got to be together. That's the whole point. If you're singing in a choir, your consonants have got to line up with everybody else in the choir. And I swear to God, the amount of times that people just shove consonants in wherever they fancy, just willy-nilly and it sounds like I don't know a herd of geese or a load of like hissing snakes and everywhere oh <sighs> the default position for lyrics is below the stave or in the case of condensed choral arrangements between the two staves but lyrics can be displayed above or below the stave depending on which musical line it corresponds to. So let's start with one part. This could be the entire choir singing in unison or just a single section, but the point is everyone is singing in unison, singing the same words at the same time. Here we have an example of some two-part music. This music uses the condensed form of layout where the two parts share a stave. Remember video one, if you're not sure what that means. The two parts have different lyrics to sing and different rhythms, so the lyrics for the higher part are shown above the stave and the lower part shown below. Now let's expand that out to a four-part arrangement. You will see each part has the words written out separately. They're all singing the same word, but at different times, so it has to be written out again to make it clear for the singers what's actually going on. Now let's see what music looks like when all the choir is singing the same words at the same rhythm. Just like this, we've got the words in between the two staves. Now, if we wanted to change what the sopranos were actually singing, the words, we'd have to write that above the top stave. But I really don't know why the sopranos would want to sing that. It's just so mean. When reading through a new choral arrangement, try to make sense of the musical notation first before approaching the lyrics. You want to be finding out what notes you should be singing, then figure out what lyrical content is attributed to your note. The most common mistake I encounter is singers reading through an arrangement and disregarding the musical notation completely. And this often leads to them singing the wrong words, the correct words at the wrong time, or even singing when they shouldn't be. But with all the information provided so far, I hope you can begin to make sense of the musical notation and use it to help your learning of new choral arrangements. Rests. Look at all of these rests. Wow. These are musical symbols that indicate time, like we explored in the first video, but unlike the musical notes we came across there, these symbols indicate silence. Music is measured in units of time called beats, and so rests indicate the number of beats, or indeed fractions of beats, that we should spend in silence. You will see here now that everything is the same as in our previous example, except the tenor notes have now been replaced by rests. This means the tenors have to sing words in their head, or just get ready to belt out their next top note. Rests, just like musical notes, come in a variety of shapes and sizes. What's most exciting is that we can make another pyramid out of all these rests. I can hear you saying, wow Jason, I didn't realise that there were so many types of rests. I really have been living under a rock all these years. To which I can only respond, 
I'd really like you to go back to your rock because this is now harassment. Let's take a sample of some real life music. I've chosen this particular excerpt because it contains a little bit of everything we've talked about so far in this video. Let's take that first phrase there, I kept my promise. Here we see that it is just sung by the sopranos, the highest voices on this stave. We know this because the altos have rests written underneath. Then we have the baritones enter next, she kept her promise, keep your distance, and they start singing she just as the sopranos get to the second syllable of promise. We can see this because vertically they're lined up. The altos first sing don't keep your distance. We know this now because of a few visual clues around the music. Firstly, there are no rests underneath and also above the stave it says unis, unison, which remember we sometimes have to look at these text instructions to get the full picture. But also on distance, the alto parts have their stems pointing down, the soprano parts have their stems pointing up, so we know that's definitely two parts. That will just about do it for this week's video. If you found this useful, do press that like button and subscribe for more. Also, if there's something regarding musical notation that you would like me to try and explain, please leave this in the comments and I'll try and get round to them in a future video. Thanks for watching.